Welcome, everyone. Hi, Namali. Hi, Lee. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. So here we are once again, and we have a reason for the colors that we are donning today. I'm wearing indigo, and Lee, you're wearing a kind of a coral. I see the coral in that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we spoke about turquoise in our last call. Turquoise and also teal, these are really high and unusual and uncommon nascent stages of human consciousness and development. And um, so to think that there are stages even beyond that is still a little bit crazy to me, but theoretically speaking, at least, um, and for some people, even experientially, these stages are there. And and they will continue to evolve into the end of humanity. So Spiral Dynamics, Claire Graves, uh, Don Beck, and the, the kind of the, that gang identified coral in Spiral Dynamics, indigo in Ken Wilber's integral theory as sort of this, the sort of the final stage. And we can talk about them in perhaps two different ways. One, um, well, well, first of all, I also want to say some of the people who have written about these higher stages, like Suzanne Kugreuter, Terry O'Fallon, they have done real research. They have said that there is a scarcity in data. I mean, Suzanne Kugreuter's word was scarcity. Um, there is not enough research. So we are, speculating to some degree. And uh, Ken Wilber himself in the book, The Religion of Tomorrow wrote, uh, these are largely hypothetical. And so, so there's a reason why uh, certainly I am hesitant sometimes to talk about these stages. Uh, but it is possible uh, certainly to explore at least some of these higher stages because as states, everyone can and might have experienced or had some access to some attributes, some aspects of these higher stages as states. So that does allow us to make some educated guesses. So I think that's what allows us to go into this uh, conversation with curiosity and uh, sometimes I roll my eyes, which Lee knows very well about that. Uh, but, you know, even I believe completely that I have read of, uh, you know, certain saints and sages who have spoken of these qualities and you can access them at any of the stages. You will interpret them from the stage that you're at. But there is valid reason to believe that these stages are real and they are forming at the frothy edge of humanity. And so it's, that's the sort of the spirit that I'm bringing into this dialogue. Um, I have a feeling nobody really knows precise information about these stages and that's okay. So once we get to stages beyond turquoise, there are a couple of ways we can look at them. Um, Claire Graves presented stages up to turquoise, um, mostly um, when spiral dynamics, I, I, in actual truth, I don't even know if Claire Graves talked about coral and whether it was mostly Don Beck and Christopher Cohen. Um, anyhow, I'm not really sure about that. Ken Wilbur called this indigo. So when we speak about these stages above turquoise, Ken Wilbur called them the third tier. And Claire Graves and uh, Don Beck and people have not spoken really of a third tier. So we can speak about these third, these third tier stages as sort of one indigo realm or one coral realm as a catch all or as Aurobindo has taught and as Ken Wilber has taught, we can also break four different stages uh, in the third tier. So I think we can do a little bit of both. I think we can start maybe by speaking a little bit about 
third tier as a catch all. And I like the word uh, Suzanne Kogreuter used, which is unitive stages. Let's maybe talk a little bit first around the way Suzanne Kogreuter talked about the, the this sort of the third tier or these the highest stages that are available uh, as unitive stages, if you will. And we can talk about the way Aurobindo and Ken Wilbur talked about them as four separate stages uh, a little bit later, maybe. So Suzanne Kogreuter really wrote about these stages in a beautiful essay called The Nine Levels of Increasing Embrace in Ego Development, um, a full spectrum theory of vertical growth and meaning making. And uh, she's a student of Jane Lovinger's work uh, where Jane Lovinger was exploring ego development. So Suzanne Kogreuter really built on that. And so I'm gonna read a little bit because it's, she writes about it be, uh, beautifully. And even what I'm going to read might seem like a little bit, a, a lot right now, but it's actually just a, a little excerpt uh, when you look at the whole essay and even everything that she wrote about the unity of stage. Individuals at this level are now able to witness the whole song and dance of prior ways of understanding and meaning making with compassion and equanimity. They understand the need of the personal ego to ensure a sense of permanence and sustainability while at the same time recognizing the illusion of this desire for permanence. The previous ways of uh, viewing reality solely from the self's, self's perspective and through the medium of language is transformed. The new paradigm has a universal or cosmic perspective as an organizing principle and has a steady place from which meaning is derived. It is non-centered in the ego although the ego is available as a perspective when useful. Unlike state experiences that gave people glimpses of mystical or unitive experiences, now these are steadily available in the witnessing stance. And that's one of the defining characteristics of third tier is that what we had access to, what we have access to as states are now readily available as traits. Unitive individuals experience themselves and others as a part of a ongoing humanity embedded in the creative ground, fulfilling the destiny of evolution. I almost want to add the word involution to that, the destiny of evolution and involution. The two sides of the Pascalian paradox are integrated, Feelings of belongingness and feeling of one's separateness and uniqueness are experienced without undue tension. They're simply changing perceptions of the unending possibilities of being. At this level of integration, adults can look at themselves and other beings in terms of the passing of ages of near and far in geographical, social, cultural, historical, intellectual, and developmental dimensions. They can take multiple points of view and shift focus effortlessly among many states of awareness. They feel embedded in nature, birth, growth, and death, joy, and pain are seen as natural occurrences, patterns of change in the flux of time. In contrast to all other stages, unitive individuals seem to have intense, non-demanding relationships with people, regardless of their development, age, gender, or any other identifications. And that's, that's huge because I think we all know that on a, or I know that at least on a steady, stable, um, uh, as a sort of steady way of being, I don't have that. I don't have that at all. Uh, I have glimpses of it. I have a large exploration around it and an allowance for that and an experiencing of that, but it is not steady and stable. So, uh, so they do that because they see the dignity on, in all manifestations of life. Others feel worthy and whole in their presence. Um, in and and you know that actually sounds a little bit like green in a sense, um, 
But in contrast to Green, at least this is what I see is a contrast to Green. She writes, stage six, which is the unitive stage, individuals feel interconnected with others uh, as all sentient beings struggle to survive and make sense of their existence. Persons at the unitive stage feel tolerance, compassion, and an affiliation with all manifestation of life, which wasn't really true for Green. Um, and just to kind of summarize, I picked another little paragraph here. Unitive adults are more likely to have a balanced, integrated sense of both their belongingness and separateness as individuals because they feel part of the ongoing evolution of the universe in all its aspects and cycles of creation, destruction, and recreation. I'll sort of talk about that in that unitive sense. Um, but then I'll also then, you know, talk a little bit around how uh, Ken Wilber uh, just introduced how Ken Wilber or Abindo talked about these higher stages as four separate stages. Um, want to also just say a little bit about like what's the difference between second tier and third tier? Um, and Ken Wilber really talks about how these tiers and the reason why he comes up with the, the that there is a, a third tier is he sees tiers as having some, some really common attributes, aspects uh, that differentiate the, the three different tiers. So second tier, which is as rare and significant as, as even that is, is still cognizing and, con and conceptualizing ultimate reality or absolute truth, the sort of the ultimate meaning of life. And, and even that is sporadic as at best. Third tier is embodying and living it. So that level of e uh, liberation from the ego, this is like a strong, an actual liberation from the ego. And that's now integral to one's entire being. So some of the big leaps um, from second tier is that in third tier, we are really entering higher and higher spiritual realms as stable traits beyond mere temporary peak states that anyone up to turquoise could have accessed and then interpreted them from the stage that they were at. Coral, indigo, and beyond, we're seeing lesser and lesser degrees of the personality and the ego. The ego is more and more ephemeral. Its grasping is more exponentially fleeting. Uh, and perhaps none at all. Maybe there's none at all at the highest of these higher stages. So these structure stages um, truly embody the transpersonal, uh, beyond egocentric, ethnocentric, world-centric, uh, sociocentric, planet-centric. It's just transcending and including all of it. Um, so the third tier is really cosmocentric, cosmocentric with a K. Again, coming back to the way Ken Wilber and Aurobindo talked about the four separate stages. In integral theory, what is uh, Ken Wilber referred to the first of these four stages as paramind or indigo, uh, which is coralline spiral dynamics, is Aurobindo's illumined mind. Um, Wilber's Second of these four higher stages is metamind, uh, which is violet. And in Aurobindo's stage model, it is intuitive mind. Intuitive mind, intuitive mind. And then Wilbur then borrows the same two names for the third and the fourth of these four higher stages as overmind and supermind. Overmind, the color is ultraviolet and the supermind is clear light. And I think according to Wilbur, those common characteristics that they share uh, in this higher stages is that they each have a transpersonal component or aspect. They recognize the higher self beyond the relative personality not only do they recognize they actually are able to really inhabit that, the, the transpersonal, transpersonality, if there is such a thing, they experience or perceive perhaps a direct embodied sense of wholeness. In other words, the, the paramind, indigo or coral is said to be able to see 
holes and the meta mind is said to be able to feel holes. The over mind can witness holes and the super mind is being whole. And again, I'm picking all of this up from uh, this book here, The Religion of Tomorrow, uh, which is a book by Ken Wilber. And the third characteristic that is common in the, in the four higher stages uh, Wilbur describes these higher stages uh, that they embody an awareness of awareness as, as an almost constant sense of awareness. A state, the states of any other tier is now a trait. So it isn't so much that one is aware of awareness, instead that in this sort of unitive space, there is no I. There, or there's very little of the eye. Instead, there is awareness as a merged embodied experience. And that sense of awareness itself is aware of awareness and consciousness. So if that makes any sense at all. Another aspect of third tier is that it is marked by a, a very specific kind of a merging of a state and a structure stage, a state and a stage. So the, the best I can take a crack at explaining that is simply that in some uh, of our prior calls, uh, Lee and I, we've talked about states of consciousness and we talked about the gross state, subtle, uh, the gross, subtle, causal and non-dual states. According to Ken Wilber, all of the stages are arising in a particular state in that every experience is a combination of a state and a stage. It's like a dance between a state and a stage, as is seen on, in the Wilbur Combs matrix, which also we talked about. But at third tier, each of those identified um, four stages um, has a particular state that is intrinsic to that particular structure. So the indigo coral para mind illumined mind structure stage is the union with the growth state, merging with the growth state. The violet meta mind intuitive mind is a union or merging with the subtle state. Uh, and the ultraviolet over mind with the causal witnessing state and the clear light a super mind is one with the, with the non-dual state. Well, thanks, Namali. So first of all, to give a little bit of context for how you can perceive these higher levels of development. Many of the people we've been discussing, like Piaget and uh, Suzanne Cook-Greiter and uh, other people who have studied development in human beings, have done so based on gathering data in the real world. So that's a way of theorizing about levels of development based on um, available data. And the advantages of that are that it's very compelling when you can do that, and it's very scientific also. And the disadvantages are that the fewer data points that exist for particular higher levels of development um, mean that you can't really see them accurately in your theorizing. In other words, um, as Suzanne cook Reuter says also in our uh, PDF and, um, and other researchers also say, is that when they see higher levels of develop development, they're not always able to separate them into um, more granular levels. So, for instance, one of the things that happened with um, uh, Abraham Maslow is that he, um, towards the end of his life, he separated out his formerly highest stage of self-actualization into two stages of self-actualization and self-transcendence. So he created a six-stage model instead of a um, five-stage model of his hierarchy of needs. So that's a way in which theorizing with data as its basis can um, lead to a division of stages the more data that we get. But there's also another way that we can approach this, and that's a reason that we can speak about these higher stages of development with at least some confidence. And that's that you can theorize based on what you've already seen and extend that 
um, concept further. So the in mathematics, that would be called analytic continuation, where you basically have a, a formula that produces a particular pattern and the pattern is incomplete. And then you just take the pattern and say, well, I expect based on the existing pattern, I expect the rest of the pattern to be so-and-so. And that actually produces very uh, effective solutions in mathematics and in other areas of life. So that's another way in which you can do it. And for instance, Sri Aurobindo, whom you mentioned, approaches this process of developmental stages from a more conceptual level. So basically says, if reality exists, then um, given the fact that we can experience oneness, then oneness should be one pole and at the other pole, we should have the experience of separation as an individual. And then levels of development should be plotted between those two poles. So then you can say that the increasing levels of ego transcendence lead within that framework naturally to the level of um, unity awareness. And that's also what we could say from Suzanne Cook Reuter's work is that indeed, even though her sample size is relatively small when she gets to this unitive stage, the pathway that we've been seeing throughout all of these previous levels of development suggests that that's the way that it's moving forward. So increasing levels of complexity and self-transcendence. So that's a way in which we can at least be somewhat confident about, um, again, the existence of these higher stages. So one way we can speak about the differentiation of these higher stages of development, as you said, was indeed to, to look at the state experiences that are available for human beings and then um, see how they are representative of stages of development. Because if we work to maintain and develop states over a prolonged period of time, they become traits, as you said. So that is a way in which we can see that these states theoretically must refer to stages of higher development. So uh, we can talk a little bit maybe around as wild as some of these higher stages are. I think the way to them, if we want to, is through the states again. So the more we experience and educate ourselves in some states that resemble these traits will perhaps give us a little bit of insight and vision which we talked about earlier into what that might be like. So I think there are some practical things we can do. We want to do as much shadow work as possible, I would say, shadow and trauma work, because at these higher stages, I, I, something that I've often felt is that as we evolve, it, stage by stage by stage, they include and they transcend and they're very fluid. There is These are not sort of uh, rungs in a ladder. They're very connected. There's potentiality for even more unknown aspects or long forgotten aspects of ourselves to still uh, kind of peek its head at these higher stages. So I would probably say do a lot of shadow and trauma work. We probably aren't able to speak very intelligently around shadow of these higher stages, but what Ken wrote was, what Wilbur wrote was that, that there could be a psychotic depersonalization a sense of being so kind of merged that one can be really moving into dissociation. I also really liked what Wilbur wrote that the supermind awareness is like this electric sense of awareness where the, the, the way that it shows up is in a state of coincidencia oppositorum. And meaning that all opposites are in union. And I love that because the closest work that I've done to that, you and I, is polarity management or polarity perspectives with Barry Johnson. So, um, so yeah, you know, to continuously see how we can see the value of what we see as this or that, to turn it into this and that. Um, and so that's, that's one practical way that we continue to do this work, um, to get a sense of what that might be. And then some of this is really koan work, uh, in the Zen tradition, there are these koans. So, uh, maybe perhaps finding a community that works with koans, 
And I think it's important to do this work in community somehow, instead of sort of dragging ourselves into certain states where we may not have someone with whom we can check it. Um, uh, uh, the community of the adequate, as Ken has written about. Ken also writes about something which I remember reading 20 something odd years ago, perhaps when I first came across this also, it's a story from Ramana Maharishi where he talks about how in relation to the overmind, when I was a very, very deep meditation uh, practitioner at the time, and it struck me like a thunderbolt. And Ken writes about this also as a, a very disturbing reality that he had to kind of really question and contemplate on like a koan. And that's that Ramana said, that which is not present in deep dreamless sleep is not real. So you, just to sort of sit with that, that which is not present in deep dreamless sleep is not real. So what is not present in deep dreamless sleep? Nothing, your entire world is absent in your deep dreamless sleep. So that means your, whatever we consider is our entire world <laughs> is not real. And that's a really scary realization that a lot of meditators, for sure, if they stick with it, they, they do encounter that. And so the return from that is when you can feel really transformed by that. Um, so work with that kind of contemplation, work, give yourself fully to working with those types uh, of koans, in a way. Speaking of exploring states, I think it's really good to think about working on flow states, to really find practical ways of entering flow states, getting to know what that is, because in a flow state, the primitive brain giving us a break. So we're not coming from that first year, second year states of fight, flight, freeze, we are much less identified with the ego. So even for little small state uh, periods of time to really explore the flow state. Um, and of course, psychedelics, I have never done that. Um, maybe expose ourselves to psychedelics with a very, very, very trained teacher uh, in a safe community. Um, and the other kind of the final thing that comes to my mind, going a little bit along the lines of polarity management, um, that sense of uh, living in a space where opposites are in union, coincidentia oppositorum, what also comes to my mind is the Hegelian dialectical uh, of taking anything and everything and always trying to put it through that thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Sometimes I can even look at perhaps first year is thesis and the sort of really first year is a lot about constructing the self and which you have to, which we all have to, constructing the ego in a sense. And then late greenish, we are turning a little bit antithesis. In other words, we're starting the deconstruction phase of, of ego and self. And so second tier, in some ways, I can look at it as antithesis, going away from all that we had constructed and believed in and really seeing a much more, well, all of that can be constructed. And then how do we bring that into the unity, the union, the communion of the, the first year and the second year? So you could maybe perhaps play around with the idea that third year is the synthesis of it all the sacred and the profane, the heaven and the marketplace, that we are fully allowing ourselves to come into synthesizing. To end this call, or to bring us to a close, I, I thought I'd love to read a little bit from uh, Ken Bober, where he writes about divine schizophrenia. And this is just a beautiful way to sort of, I guess, kind of remember who we are and what we and sort of vision into perhaps is. So this is uh, in the book, One Taste. With the awakening of constant consciousness, which is what we're talking about in these higher stages, 
you become something of a divine schizophrenic in the popular sense of split minded, because you have access to both the witness and the ego. You are actually whole minded, but it sounds like a split because you are aware of the constant witness of spirit in you. And you are also perfectly aware of the movie of life, the ego and all its ups and downs. So you still feel pain and suffering and sorrow, but they can no longer convince you of their importance. You are no longer the victim of life, but its witness. In fact, because you are no longer afraid of your feelings, you can engage them with much greater intensity. The movie of life becomes more vivid and vibrant precisely because you are no longer grasping or avoiding it, and thus no longer trying to dull or dilute it. You no longer turn the volume down. You might even cry harder, laugh louder, jump higher. Choiceless awareness doesn't mean you cease to feel. It means you feel fully, feel deeply, feel to infinity itself, and laugh and cry and love until it hurts. Life jumps right off the screen and you are one with all of it because you don't recoil. If you are having a dream and you think it's real, it can get very scary. Say you are dreaming that you are tightrope walking across Niagara Falls. If you fall off, you plunge to your depth. So you're walking very slowly, very carefully. Then suppose you start lucid dreaming and you realize that it's just a dream. What do you do? Become more cautious and careful. No, you start jumping up and down on a tightrope. You do flips, you bounce around. You have a ball precisely because you know it isn't real. When you realize it's a dream, you can afford to play. The same thing happens when you realize that ordinary life is just a dream, just a movie, just a play. You don't become more cautious, more timid, more reserved. You start jumping up and down and doing flips precisely because it's all a dream. It's all pure emptiness. You don't feel less, you feel more because you can afford to. You're no longer afraid of dying and therefore you're not afraid of living. You become radical and wild, intense and vivid, shocking and silly. You let it all come pouring through because it's all your dream. Life then assumes a, its true intensity, its vivid luminosity, its radical effervescence. Pain is more painful and happiness is happier. Joy is more joyous and sorrow even sadder. It all comes radiantly alive to the mirror mind, the mind that doesn't grasp or avoid, but simply awareness, but simply witnesses the play and therefore can afford to play even as it watches. This is so beautiful because we're, it's talking about all the things that we've talked about today in these four separate sage stages. What would motivate you if you saw everything as the dream of your own higher self? What would actually move you in this playful dream world? Everything in the dream is basically fun at some deep level except for this. When you see your friends suffering because they think the dream is real, you want to relieve their suffering. You want them to wake up too. Watching them suffer is not fun. And so a deep and powerful compassion arises in the heart of the awakened one. And they seek above all else to awaken others and thus relieve them from the sorrow and the pity, the torment and the pain, the terror and the anguish that comes from taking with dreadful seriousness the passing dream of life. So you are a divine schizophrenic. You are split minded in the sense that you are simultaneously in touch with both the pure witness and the world of the ego film. But that really means you are actually whole-minded because these two worlds are really not two. The ego is just the dream of the witness, the film, 
that the witness creates out of its own infinite plentitude, simply so it will have something to watch at the movies. At that point, the entire play arises within your own constant consciousness. There is no inside and no outside, no in here versus out there. The non-dual universe of one taste arises as a spontaneous gesture of your own true nature. You can taste the sun and swallow the moon and centuries fit in the palm of your hand. The pure I, I, the great I amness breathes to infinity and creates a cosmos as the song of its very self. The oceans of compassion fall as tears from your very own original face. <laughs> I'm just getting emotional. Last night, I saw the reflection of the moon in a cool, clear crystal pond and nothing else happened at all. Ooh. There's nothing to say. Maybe that's where we close. <laughs> okay. What do you say, Lee? Well, that's the... Uh... Conclusion of this uh, series about uh, spiral dynamics and the uh, additional high levels uh, as seen through integral theory. So um, thanks everyone for watching and thanks Namali. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Bye everyone. Yeah. Bye.